everyone. Uh, welcome back to BIEB 152, Evolution of Infectious Disease. This is lecture number 19. It's our last lecture. Uh, this is a review of the content from the second half of the course. There's a re review from the uh, first half of the course if you want to go back and, and listen to that one. Uh, the way that the course is designed is that we build on things that we learn in the first half of the course um, in the second half of the course, there'll be, you'll see a little bit of a review of that stuff in this lecture, um, just because everything's kind of integrated at this point. Okay, so um, this is the last taking the temperature of COVID-19. And it's, uh, as everything in this pandemic, there's kind of mixed news. If you look at the, we've looked at these graphs many times. Um, these are from the New York Times. And what it's showing you are the number of new cases per different areas of the world. So the first graph is for the entire world. What we can see is we have these different dynamics where this is when it was breaking out in China. This is when it was spreading to the rest of the world. And a lot of these numbers are actually caused by the United States. Uh, then we plateaued and so did this trend. Um, but now the disease is spreading more and more to new countries. A lot of southern hemisphere countries that seem to uh, have some kind of buffer against it at first are now receiving it. It might have been because they were in summer and now the seasons are changing, or it just might have been that the southern hemisphere tends not to be as connected to the rest of the world. Uh, so it's, it's unclear what's causing that, but there's definitely an increase in the number of COVID-19 cases or the, the rate at which we're, there's new COVID-19 cases around the world. This could also be due to increased testing, but there's some places that have actually decreased testing, so it's hard to, it's hard to exactly say. Here's the overall trend in the United States. So lucky for, for us as a whole, things are declining. The new number of new cases per day is not as high as it once was. A lot of this decline is actually being caused by uh, the fact that New York is declining. Uh, new York was the center of of the epidemic in the United States. And now a lot of people have immunity. They were exposed to COVID-19. Um, and so the disease is harder to spread and we have seasonal changes and behavioral changes that are causing this, this, this pattern to bend down. However, this is glossing over a lot of finer detail in that if you take a more uh, regional look, you can see that there's some states in which the number of COVID-19 cases or the rate of production of new COVID-19 cases is increasing. And one of the, those states, unfortunately, is California, where a lot of us are, where I certainly am. <clears throat> and so that's definitely bad news. Um, and it's especially bad news as we open up the state uh, and that as we have these mass protests. So I am very concerned about our sort of uh, local regions. It turns out that a lot of these cases um, are in areas that were not hit at first by the disease. And so a lot of these new cases are in less populated areas, but you know, it's having this effect of increasing the number of new cases per day. And a lot of these cases are also in the LA area. What's going on in San Diego? Uh, so that's where I am right now and the university is. Uh, we can see that we've had kind of ups and downs in San Diego and we've sort of stabilized at the same rate of new cases over time. And it's a relatively low rate. But I am very nervous that as we open up, that that'll increase again. So this is really mixed news. What I think all of this news means is that the virus is around. The virus is still spreading. The virus is you know, in each and every state. And so if we do relax too much, then we are going to see that virus reemerge and begin to you know, have a trajectory more like the beginning of the pandemic than the, the more stable dynamics that are happening right now. Okay, so some interesting, more sciencey news. During the course, we learned about how there is a mutation in human populations that confers resistance to HIV. This was that uh, CCR5 uh, mutation, that, that deletion, the 32 uh, base deletion. And we do know that actually a lot of human genetic variation uh, arises because it gives us resistance to our pathogens. And so what that means is that there should be a lot of genetic variation in general that affects our vulnerability to different pathogens. 
So what does that mean more specifically? Some people have genes that make them more resistant or more vulnerable to different viruses. And so that turns out that that is also true for COVID-19. Um, this is a study that was just published uh, two days ago. This is not peer reviewed yet. This is on Med uh, RX ar archive. So, you know, it has all the caveats that I normally give for this kind, these kinds of studies, uh, but it's a, very, it's a very good one. And so basically what they showed is that there's two areas in human genomes and that there are genetic mutations in these areas that make people more or less sensitive to really extreme cases of COVID-19. So everybody in their sample had COVID-19. What they were looking for is whether or not there's an association between certain mutations in the genome and whether or not your case of COVID-19 got really bad and that you needed to be intubated and so forth. And so that's what they're, what they're doing is that they have genetic markers throughout the entire human genome on every single chromosome throughout, spread throughout the chromosomes. And then they see if there's an association with a particular marker and enhanced disease state. And so the way that they do this is with this analysis called a GWAS. That's a genome-wide association study, GWAS. And they usually present this, these kinds of data in uh, these Manhattan plots. And what you're looking at here is, you can think of this axis here as telling you how likely there is an association between some genetic variation in this location of the chromosome and the characteristic that you're looking for, so sensitivity to COVID-19. So what's on the y-axis, I should have probably started here, that's a little bit easier to understand. It's just the different chromosomes and the position in the different chromosomes in the human genome. So what this red line, dotted line here is, this is a threshold that says, okay, given statistical noise and everything else, if the signal crosses that threshold, then we can be certain that there's some kind of mutation in that region of the genome that causes varying sensitivity to COVID-19. And so what they found, and so this is a type of study that doesn't say that, oh, there's only two genes in the genome that give you variable sensitivity to COVID-19. This is a study that, that tells you that there's at least two, but there's probably more if they had a larger sample size or a different group of people, they might have been able to find uh, more uh, sites. But they were able to find two sites. This is the ABO blood type. It turns out that if you are type A, uh, you have a, an increased risk of having a severe case of COVID-19. If you are type O, then you have a decreased risk of having a really severe case of COVID-19. The other one that's interesting is here. There's a bunch of genes associated with this region of the human genome. And there's one in particular, this SLC6A20, that encodes for an interaction partner with uh, angiotensin uh, converting. Sorry, I, I've never actually read that word before. Converting enzyme to, oh, I'm sorry, that's ACE. <laughs> I should know that. I've said ACE2 a million times. Sorry. So basically, this is a gene that interacts with ACE2. And so if that's, that seems if it modifies the ACE2 or interacts with ACE2 in some way, then it might change it in a way that makes ACE2 more receptive to the spike protein, or maybe it hides the ACE2 from the spike protein. So you can imagine variation having uh, kind of both effects. So they don't know that for sure. Uh, they just know that that area of the genome has this association uh, with more or less vulnerability to COVID-19. And that's their candidate gene that they will study more in the future to figure out how it is actually working to influence vulnerability. Yeah, so that's, that's really interesting. This is amazing. You know, we're going through a pandemic during the genomic era. We have all of these uh, genome sequences of humans, and we have all these tools to look at these SNPs throughout the, the human genome and to make these associations. And yeah, so we're, we're getting sort of, we're getting real-time data on the virus's genome and how it's evolving, but we're also getting real-time data 
on you know, what makes us more or less susceptible to this virus. And it would be amazing, although I don't think we're, we're quite there yet, is if we could actually maybe even watch kind of co-evolution um, between the virus and, and humans as well. But that's probably out of the scope of things. But at least we can look at the genetic variation of the virus and associate how it's changing and then the genetic variation in humans and see how it's conferring resistance to the, to the virus. So, okay, pretty interesting stuff. So this is the last lecture. This is the second half review. Now we're gonna plunge into the lecture material. Okay, so just to kind of summarize some of the things that we talked about in the first half of the term. So the first half of the term, I focused a lot on evolutionary processes, the mechanisms by which evolution works. And I, you, could, you could also call this population genetics. So we're thinking about how mutations arise in a population of bacteria or a population of viruses. Uh, we're talking about recombination, how you know, different segments of genomes transfer between each other and also horizontal gene transfers uh, as a subcategory there. We talked about genetic drift, you know, how mutations randomly fluctuate in populations. We talked about natural selection, how the survival of the fittest, the mutation that gives you an advantage, allows that uh, genome to spread and then eventually that mutation to fix in the population. And so these are all these population genetic mechanisms. These are the things that are actually driving evolutionary biology. We started with them so that we would understand um, how it works. And so then we could start applying it to interpreting what's going on with our own diseases. The way that you can sort of think about these, these four different mechanisms is that the first two are mechanisms that generate genetic variation. And then the second two mechanisms are, once you have this genetic variation, what happens to it? Does it sort of, does it fix? Does it go extinct? Does it persist for a while in the population? What are the dynamics that happen to the, the, that genetic variation? And that, those, that genetic variation is guided by random drifts up and down in the population, or it's driven by natural selection, where uh, if something's good, it's promoted in the population. If something's bad, then it diminishes in the population. So it's important to remember that many of these processes are stochastic, and then one of the processes is actually deterministic. So mutation is random. Uh, recombination is kind of a mix of random and non-random. So, but we, we didn't really talk too, too much about recombination and it's really hard to actually predict with mathematics. So it's, you know, it's, it is random with respect to whether or not the variation is adaptive. So we'll call it stochastic and random. Uh, genetic drift is also random. It's just that sort of coin flip process. You know, is an allele lucky? Does it raise in frequency? Is it unlucky? Does it decrease in frequency? That's genetic drift. And so those are all random processes. And then you have natural selection. And natural selection takes all the good stuff, promotes it, takes all the bad stuff, and pushes it out of the, the population and out of the genome. And so when you see a pattern in evolutionary biology, a non-random pattern, then that is typically caused by natural selection. And so a lot of times we, we want to know whether or not thing, organisms are adapting, whether or not genes are adapting to fit their environment. And so the way that we can tell that is by assessing whether or not there is non-random patterns to what we're observing. So randomness is caused by mutation and genetic drift, and this non-randomness is caused by natural selection. And so a lot of what we're going to talk today when we're trying to figure out how the diseases evolve we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the pattern we'd expect by random processes? And then does the pattern that we observe deviate from that random process? And that's, um, that's really critical to making inferences about evolution. Okay, so this is just some simulations and from the first part of the, the course, but it's just showing you this sort of tension between genetic drift and natural selection. And that depending on the circumstances, you can have a population that is evolving just by genetic drift. Um, you could have a population that's evolving kind of by both processes where, you know, the fate of alleles is determined almost equally by the drift effects and the natural selection effects. Or you could have situations 
where you know selection is very strong, it overwhelms drift, and so most of the uh, behavior of the population is uh, determined by that natural selection and not by uh, genetic drift. And so, but these things, there's a, there's a tension between these all the time, and you know whether or not the, the knobs that sort of twist up genetic drift are re reducing the population size, and the, the knob that affects natural selection is the fitness difference between uh, different mutations in the population. And so this is just a link to that the simulator that uh, makes these great graphs and lets us explore those population genetic dynamics. Okay, so that, that's my summary of the first half of the class about you know, the different mechanisms uh, that drive evolution. And in the second half of the class, basically we're investigating how pathogens have evolved. And so we have a pattern and then we try to reconstruct the processes that gave us that pattern by knowing sort of how evolution works and looking for non-random and random patterns and so forth, and then sort of reconstructing what, what exactly happened. So that's, that's the focus of most of the rest of uh, today's review. One of the first things that we, we worked on in the second half was on phylogenies. So phylogenies show the evolutionary relationship uh, between OTUs, that's operational taxonomic units, that's anything that we're, we're assessing, we're sequencing the, the genes from, and they go at the very end of the, the, the tree, the very tips of the, the tree. And so here we have species A and species B. Those are two different OTUs. This is a phylogeny, you know, showing us an evolutionary relationship. They had a recent common ancestor with one another. And what I wanna show you here is how you get from those population genetic processes to creation of these phylogenies over long evolutionary time. And so what I just wanted to show is that, you know, maybe here's a dynamic of a particular mutation. This is the A mutation. So it spontaneously arose. Uh, so this is time on the y-axis. So it spontaneously arose in this population. It has an increasing trajectory. It looks like it's, you know, it's governed by a little bit of drift, but a lot of selection as well. So this beneficial mutation was spreading through the population. And then at, a, at some point it fixes in the population what that means at this tick mark here, it means that all the individuals at this point in this population have that mutation. So they didn't have it back here, and now all of them have it here. And so this dynamic here, which is characterized over here, led to the evolution of the population. And so what these tick marks, these mutations that turn into substitutions, so that's a mutation, turns into a substitution, they are what give you genetic distance. So it's what builds these arms of the tree or branches of the tree. And you get these bifurcations when populations split and they begin to get unique mutations along this arm and unique, unique mutations along that arm. So we spent a lot of time going over how to build these phylogenies, uh, but I really want you to be able to sort of capture and imagine what's going on, how you get from those population genetic dynamics to constructing these evolutionary relationships in these really crazy patterns that we see sometimes in phylogenies. Okay, so just really quickly, just to sort of jog your memory of how to uh, construct a phylogenetic tree, what we do is we have a bunch of sequences of organisms that are living today. And we wanna understand how they're related to each other, when they evolved, and when different characteristics of these organisms evolved. The first step to doing that is to build these phylogenies. And so you just take these, you know, these uh, DNA or RNA sequences, um, you, they're, they're taken from different related organisms and you align them next to each other so that you know, site number one is always site number one in all of these different organisms. And then you begin to compare them and see where are their differences in these sequences. And then what looks like completely complete nonsense to me you know, just A, T, G, C, blah, 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 then you can actually turn that nonsense into an evolutionary relationship and then begin to, to reconstruct history, not, you know, by digging up fossils, um, not by, uh, you know, certainly not by time traveling, but sort of by time traveling, by looking at these existing genetic codes and reaching back in time and figuring out what happened. Okay, so... But we all know that the actual procedure to reconstruct 
that time and that history is not nearly as exciting as I try to make it out to seem. So what do we do? Remember, often we have information about the sequences and that we've chosen one or a handful of sequences that are in organisms that we know are evolutionarily distinct from the focal organisms in our study. And what this does is it allows us to root the tree and so it gives us direction in our phylogeny. We know that Salmonella is a completely different genera of bacteria from these. They're very genetically distinct. So we can say, okay, this one here is going to be more different than all of these other sequences here. We have outside information uh, on that. And so we establish it as the root. That says that, okay, all of these other sequences here evolved out here in the tree and that gives us direction and gives us an understanding of you know, what changed at what time in history. So rooting the tree is very important. Then we wanna go through and we wanna to begin to look at information here and make guesses for which sets of OTUs are most similar to each other and what the likely structure of this tree is. It's a guess, it's a hypothesis. And then we, we sort of go through the data, we go through the sequences and see if this hypothesis that we come up with makes sense. If it doesn't, then we have to start over and, and create a new hypothesis. This is, it's an iterative process. Typically, you know, computers do this, not, not humans, um, but you have to understand sort of the logic that you use in order to construct these phylogenies. And so the logic is called parsimony. And basically what you're doing when you're applying parsimony is that you are trying to minimize the number of mutations or substitutions that happen on the tree, the number of tick marks on the tree. We know that evolution is slow, evolution is random, evolution takes a long time. And so it, it is most likely that very little evolution happens on the tree. And so we wanna minimize the number of times we uh, hypothesize that a mutation or a substitution happened on that tree. Okay, so the way that we first get a little bit of insight on how these things are structured is we count up the number of genetic differences uh, between these sequences. And so we're just counting up that there's two differences between these two sequences. Let's look, so no difference, oh, one difference, no difference, one difference. So two differences in total. And so that's true. There's three differences with these guys, and there's only one difference between B and K12. And so we would hypothesize that K12 and B are closely related in the phylogenetic tree. And so we put them there, clustered together. And then we want to ask ourselves, are there any nucleotides that B and K12 share, but not O157? And so why we want to ask that question is that would establish that these things, these guys cluster together um, and that there's a mutation here that separates them from the rest of the tree. And so, in fact, that's what we see is that there one, there's one that has, uh, this has a C here and a C here, um, but the O157 and the Salmonella both have G. And so that would suggest that O157 comes out here in the tree that there's a mutation that separates, that happens on this branch that separates these two OTUs from the rest of the tree, and that the O157 has a ancestral state of that nucleotide. And so that's how you build it onto the tree. You say, okay, O157 happens there, there's a G to C change, and that explains why these two have different nucleotides in this, in this part of their genome. Different nucleotides from the rest, not different nucleotides from each other just to be clear. Okay, so now this is our hypothesis. We have, we have one mutation supports this hypothesis. Uh, there's four mutations in total in this uh, data set. And so do the other substitutions, do they also support this hypothesis? And so let's just go through one by one. And the way that you assess whether or not they support this hypothesis is that you can put a single genetic change on the phylogeny that can explain, given the structure, can explain these sequences. So for instance, this is K12. It has a different nucleotide in this position than the rest of the, strain, the strains. And so that suggests that 
there is a mutation that happened from the common ancestor V to K12 going out to K12. Um, and so that single mutation happened here. We only have to put one mutation, one tick mark on the phylogeny. And so I would say that that supports the structure. It hasn't introduced any homoplasy. We'll go over the definition of homoplasy in a second. Um, but that's when you would have to put two separate tick marks to explain the mutation at a single site. The next step is, okay, you know, is this mutation congruent with the structure? And uh, we find out that it is. This is a single mutation in 0157. It happens here on the branch that extends out just to 0157. And then we have this mutation here. We have uh, all of these guys have A's and the salmonella has a T. And so, yeah, even though there's, there's really three OTUs that have this genetic change, we can explain that with just a single tick mark uh, at the base of the tree here. When the, these organisms were diverging from each other, there was this mutation and it now resides in all of these genomes out here. And so in fact, this tree, our first hypothesis was correct. Of course, there are more complicated trees and more complicated data sets, and it won't be that easy. And you guys uh, went over many of these more complicated problems in your, your homework assignments. Uh, so definitely go back and check those out. I just wanted to jog your memory and remind you of the terminology and how all of this works. So uh, there are key concepts in, in phylogenetics that, that we went over. Um, these are just a, a subset, but they're really important uh, to understand in order to be able to build these phylogenies and also in order to be able to read the phylogenies. And so uh, what we have here, we have three terms, common ancestor, homoplasia, and monophyl. So common ancestor is a term that refers to the hypothesis for an ancestor. So remember, we only have the OTUs. We only have information on what exists today. And we're going back in time. And we're making a hypothesis about ancestral forms that existed a long time ago. And we're interested in these branching points where there is an ancestral population and genome that split up and diverged into two new OTUs. So that common ancestor for B and C is D. The common ancestor for A, B, and C is E back here. And so D is not the common ancestor for A and B. If you go back in the tree, the common ancestor for A and B is this E back here. So that's how you, you trace back in the tree and you see where is the most recent point in which the, the branch splits that leads the lineages that go off in this direction and the lineage that goes off in that direction. Okay, homoplasy. This is when you have parallel evolution or reversions. These are instances that sort of mess up your ability to reconstruct the phylogenetic tree because this A would group A and B together and take B and move it away from C but we, we, had some, we had some other information that told us that this is actually the true phylogeny. And so therefore this must be two independent times where C turned to A. Parallel evolution is rare, but we saw examples of it, especially in antibiotic resistance in CF patients' lungs by Delosa, if you remember. And so it does happen. And hopefully we have enough other sequence data that doesn't have homoplasies in it that can help us reveal the true pattern. And we just have to sort of wash out the, the influence of this homoplasy. Um, and so these are important for a number of reasons. Uh, they interfere with our ability to create phylogenies, but also if you see a particular mutation happening again and again on the phylogenetic tree, it suggests that's a non-random pattern. And so it suggests that uh, natural selection is actually favoring that mutation, that there's something adaptive about that mutation. And so you can use that as a key to figure out what mutations are, are beneficial. So Tammy Lieberman did this, if you want to go back to the lecture about her stuff. Okay, the last thing is monophyly. And this, I think students often think of this as, you know, maybe just some jargon that professors make them learn in order for them to test them on the final exam. But that's not true. I don't teach jargon just for jargon's sake. And Monophyly, it's really this concept, and your ability to identify monophyly is really critical to being able to read phylogenetic trees. So what I mean by that is that what is a monophyletic group, and then we'll get into real data 
real phylogenetic trees so that it's crystal clear why you need to be able to identify those groups in order to read a phylogenetic tree. And so C and B are a monophyletic group, uh, C, B, and A are a monophyletic group, paraphyletic groups would be A and C or A and B. Um, and so the way that you identify monophyletic groups is you take a given ancestor, so D is the ancestor to B and C, and so if that group that you draw a circle around includes all of the descendants from D, then that's a monophyletic group. The reason why A and B are not is because their common ancestor is E, and one descendant from E is C, but it's not included in, the, in your circle around A and B. And so that's a paraphyletic group. The reason why I harp on understanding monophyly and being able to see it in trees is that it helps you interpret the evolution of diseases. And we, we use this all the, the time to figure out what is going on with epidemics and so forth. So for instance, we can look at monophyletic groups of HIV that are spreading in humans, and we can see that there's, there's different monophyletic groups that are spreading in humans that are separated by simian viruses, SIV. And so we know that this is a small monophyletic group the, the closest uh, relatives to this group are both a mix of other HIVs and SIVs. And so therefore, this monophyletic group must have been a case where HIV moved from SIVs into humans. Same here, same here, same there, and same there. And so being able to identify these monophyletic groups helps you see exactly where in the phylogeny when these host range changes happen and what's important is that you would assume that if you didn't have this information, that all HIV viruses emerged into the human population at the same time. But actually, we see that there's many different times where HIV came into the human population. This helps us understand why there's so much genetic diversity in HIV. But it also helps us understand why HIV-2 patients that have this type of HIV, their disease behaves very differently than people that have HIV-1 spreads uh, much slower than HIV-1 does, and so it helps us begin to understand that variation. But it also, in the long run, and not that we've figured this out yet, when you look at SIV populations, given that these SIVs are in this sort of portion of the phylogenetic tree where we see multiple different times where emergence has happened, it might tell us that ah, there, there could be something genetically unique about these SIVs that would would facilitate future host range expansions. So we'd want to study that, understand that, and hopefully be able to block uh, those emergencies from happening in the future. So all of this is based on our ability to recognize monophyletic groups and then reconstruct when host ranges, uh, host range expansions actually happened during the evolution of these diseases. Over here, this help, helped us understand, but by being able to recognize monophyletic groups, and that these monophyletic groups are associated with different patients, that led us to understand that when a CF patient got the strain of Delosa that was causing this epidemic in the Boston area, that strain then took hold in the, the lungs and then remained there throughout the course of the, the disease, that patients weren't getting new strains and an influx of new strains, that it was a sort of a one-time incident that caused the infection, spread in the lungs, and it established itself there. And so that helped us understand uh, the dynamics of this disease. And then you know, in the future, hopefully we can modify our behaviors to stop the, the spread of things like Delosa to CF patients. Okay, so I just wanted to go over, this was a section problem. This was on trying to figure out host range expansions I had some questions in office hours about this, so I wanted to go over this now as we're talking about monophyletic groups. Um, I think this is a really active way for you to you know, really cement this idea of reconstructing evolutionary events that happened in the past um, using phylogenies, thinking about parsimony and thinking about monophyletic groups. So we have all of these different OTUs. They are associated with different hosts. This is, we'll say, influenza. And the question is, since we have all these different hosts, we had a, a strain that was ancestral to these that probably had a limited host range. So when did it evolve to switch and go into horses and cats 
in humans and pigs and chickens and geese and so forth. And so we could create a hypothesis. And so this is Wrigley. Sorry, I'm in my office today, so that's all of Wrigley that we'll see. We could have the hypothesis that, oh, the influenza was spreading in dogs a long time ago, and then it spread to all of these host species, right? So basically, I'm coming up with like the worst possible hypothesis that you could imagine. It could be true. There's nothing wrong about the hypothesis, except it's not parsimonious. And so you can imagine that, oh, maybe it was infecting something completely random, that there's no sign of it in the modern, modern virus. Or you could sort of build a better hypothesis that perhaps the ancestral one actually used one of the hosts that its descendants still use. So that's, that's sort of one, one problem with this hypothesis. Another problem is what I'm doing here, and this is basically the laziest way to come up with a hypothesis for host range expansion, is that I've just said that at the very tips of the tree, and each of these tips, there was evolution where variant that infected dogs can now infect chickens, can now infect chickens, chickens, chickens. Here's one, one that went and now infects horses, now infects horses, now infects humans, and so forth. And so I've just said, oh, okay, there's tons of, tons of host range expansion evolution happening at the tips of the tree. And you know this is not fundamentally wrong, but it's not parsimonious. And it's unlikely that this is what the evolution of host range expansion uh, was to, to create this pattern of, in the phylogeny. And so let's start out with Wrigley. You know, it's unlikely that none of the viruses that exist today um, are able to infect the ancestral host. It, it's unlikely that it was, it was dog back then. And so the question is, well, you know, given information on this side of the phylogeny, what is the likely ancestral host? And there's kind of two ways to go about this, okay? First, you can say, is one of the hosts very common in this side of the phylogeny? And by common, I don't want you to just go through and count up the number of OTUs that are associated with the host. For instance, like cats dominate all of these OTUs, but cats are actually only in one spot in the phylogeny, Whereas something like a chicken is in two spots, humans are in two spots, horses are in two spots. And so, you know, it doesn't seem like, yeah, there's a lot of OTUs that we sampled for cats. Maybe we loved cats and that's why we were sampling them. But they're actually in just a small region of the phylogeny. And so they're unlikely to be the ancestral host species. And the way that you can recognize this is that basically this is one monophyletic group. And so to explain this, you could have just a single host range shift from horses to cats back here, and then all of the descendants would be for cats. And so you would explain this just by a single evolutionary event. And so even though there's lots of OTUs that are associated with cats, they're all clustered together. And so they likely aren't the ancestral version. It's likely caused by just a single host shift here. And so, okay, so what we wanna look at is distinct monophyletic groups at this end of the phylogeny. And so what we see is that, oh, this is a distinct monophyletic group for chickens, and this is another one for chickens, although they're clustered, you know, at this end of the phylogeny relatively close to each other. So maybe, you know, maybe that's not it. There's one human and human, that's, these are distinct as well. And so, but they are also clustered in this small section of the phylogeny. Um, when we look at horses, there's two monophyletic groups for horses. And if you go back in time, to find out where their common ancestor is, we find that it goes back all the way to common ancestor for all of these OTUs. So I, I hope you, you guys can see that. If you trace a path between this horse and that horse, you get back to here. And so that suggests that the horse is, is the ancestral host. And then we get a bunch of host range shifts that happen uh, further out in the phylogeny. So that's just our guess. It could be wrong, but let's, let's sort of establish that and go through the phylogeny. And so to explain all these chickens, we just need one change here, horse to chicken. To, I'm calling this feline instead of cat. So H to F explains all of those. That's nice and easy. We don't have to have any mutations here because the ancestor actually has horse. Uh, we don't have to have any changes, evolutionary changes 
down on this branch because the ancestor is horse. But we do have to start working our way through this sort of intricate section here. And if you see all of this change, you know a lot of stuff is happening. And this is going to be the tricky part of the phylogeny. And so we see we have two humans, we have a goose, we have chicken, and we have these two pigs here. So what we could do, which is not actually parsimonious, or the most parsimonious, is that we can have, okay, this is all of these back here, all of these nodes are able to, these common ancestors are able to infect horses. And so you have a horse to a human shift, a horse to a pig shift, a horse to a chicken shift, horse to goose, and horse to human. Now, we have two horses to humans really close to each other in the phylogenetic tree. That's the first signal that hmm, maybe there's actually a smarter way to capture the, the evolution here. So smarter, I mean parsimonious way to explain what happened out here. And so what you can do is now erase the tick marks that you have on your, on your phylogeny and sort of rethink what, what, what might have happened in this part of the, the evolution of this pathogen. And so what you would do is you say, okay, there's one human here and one human here. What if I had evolution to switch to humans here so that this common ancestor switched to humans? And so it would explain that human, it would explain that human with just a single mutation. We were explaining those two before with two separate evolutionary events. Now we, we explain it with just one. And so, well, that seems good. That seems parsimonious. But then it gets complicated because now we have to explain the rest of the evolution in this group. And we, when we do that, we have now humans giving it to geese, humans giving it to chicken, humans passing it on to pigs. And that actually works out. And now we have a tree that has six host range shifts. And that's the most parsimonious explanation for this pattern out here. Uh, we started with a tree that had you know, uh, 10 to 20, however many OTUs. Uh, there are, and now we're down to just six. And so when you're doing this problem, you're trying to maximize the fewest number of shifts possible. And, you know, make sure that you, you sort of see things like that humans could spread it to geese and chickens and pigs. We actually, you know, we think of other species as being reservoir species for viruses that then emerge and spread into human populations, but we're actually a reservoir species for influenza, we saw a figure about data on that from an earlier lecture in the course. And we had that example where humans infected a tiger in the Bronx Zoo with COVID-19. So that's a host range expansion from humans to, to that tiger. And so that does happen. Don't, don't let your sort of human biases influence your ability to do these, these problems. Interpret the data. Okay, so we can do very similar things and use similar logic of parsimony to reconstruct pathways of spread uh, from one patient to another patient, from one area of a hospital to another area of the hospital. But in the last lecture, we specifically talked about how you could use these methods in order to figure out how SARS-CoV-2 has spread around the world. And so we have lots of problems in the homework assignments and the sections, but basically you use these mutation matrices. So what we have are different mutations on the x-axis and different isolates from patient A and from patient B and from patient C and D and E. Uh, but remember, the, we're sequencing the isolates of, so we're sequencing a pathogen removed from that patient. And of course, you can remove a couple different samples from a single patient, and there could be genetic diversity in that pathogen. And so that would help you understand the patterns of how it's spread around the hospital as well. If you had that additional information. And so that's, that's related to that homework problem that was pretty tricky for, for some students. So what we have here is we wanna start with the pathogen that has the fewest mutations. So this A has three mutations, and then B has one additional mutation. So there's an error that connects A and B, and then C has one additional mutation. So there's an error that connects B to C, and D and E both have one additional mutation as well. It's a distinct mutation from the one that C has. And so that's what causes this bifurcation here and a second arrow happening from B. And so then the question is, did D or E come first? And the way that you can figure that out is by looking at this epidemiological data and see 
did D overlap with B or did E overlap with B? If only one of them overlapped with B, then it's likely that that patient got the pathogen first and then quickly spread it to this pathogen. Uh, there hasn't been enough time for it to actually develop an extra mutation. And so what we find here is that if we look at D is in wards one and four, B is in wards two, one, and five. So they overlap at the same time in the same ward with D. So this is, this is our likely pathway first to, from B to D and then to E. We see that E doesn't overlap with B at all, but E does overlap with uh, D in the hospital. And so it's likely then that D spread it to E. So this is the way that now we're coupling, you know, thinking about pathways of evolution and evolutionary relationships between these, these pathogens to reconstruct these pathways. And sometimes we need extra information that we can glean from this epidemiological data here that people routinely collect in hospitals where patients are uh, and which patients overlap with them. Okay, so we can figure out roughly in the phylogeny when host range expansions happened or when in when people were infected by these diseases, or we can actually use these evolutionary relationships to establish pathways of transmission. And we can couple that information with molecular clocks so that we, we can not just sort of point where in the phylogeny something happened, but we can actually attach a time to when that happened. How long ago in the past did, did that epidemic happen? How long ago did HIV spread from primates to humans. And so we talked a lot about molecular clocks. And the idea there is that as you have time, so passing, so generations, you will increase the number of substitutions that you observe in a genome. And so, you know, at some time point, there's no mutations. And as generations pass, they randomly mutate drift or natural selection acts on those mutations and then you get a buildup of those substitutions in genomes and that increases through time and what we learned is that if those mutations are neutral mutations if they have no fitness benefit and they're not deleterious then they will actually accumulate at a very steady rate and that steady rate is directly proportional to mu b times the number of bases that you're looking at. So it's directly proportional to the mutation rate. And so how you calculate the substitution rate for a given sequence of DNA or RNA is you take that per base mutation rate, and then you look at the entire stretch of that DNA or RNA, and you calculate you know, what is the rate of mutation across all of those bases. So you start with the per base mutation rate, and you just expand that out to whatever window you're looking at in the genome. So we know that if mutations are neutral, then they should accumulate in a very clock-like, very predictable way that's set by the underlying genomic mutation rate. So that's what this graph is showing us here. And so what we can do is we can take modern sequences. And so here's a DNA sequence from one OTU. Here's a DNA sequence from another OTU. I've just highlighted where they differ from each other. So these red mutations happened on this, this branch of the phylogenetic tree. These green mutations happened on this branch of the phylogenetic tree, and they shared a common ancestor at some point in the, in the past. And we want to know, when did, they, when did they split off from each other? How long ago was this common ancestor? Uh, and we can use that to date that, but we can also use that to figure out you know, when, if this common ancestor was, um, if these are the different HIV strains then this common ancestor, indicates roughly when SIV spread to humans. And so the way that we do that is we can take, okay, there have been 10 substitutions that have happened in total. So there's 10 differences between this sequence and that sequence. And then we have the underlying per base per generation uh, mutation rate. We know how many, how large that window that we're looking at, how many nucleotides are, are, are we actually looking at. And then if we actually want to get to a calendar date, we also have to add extra information, this generation time. Uh, remember, the mutation rate is the, the time component of the mutation rate is per generation. It's not uh, per you know, calendar year or per minute or anything like that. It's per generation. If you want to convert per generation into 
an actual number of days or months or years or so forth, then you have to make this conversion from generation to, uh, to days. So if we have all of this information, we can actually just back calculate when this, when this actually happened. And so to do that, we use this equation here. We have time to split, total number of polymorphic sites divided by the DNA sequence length times mu b. So this is just the rate of mutation for that window of DNA sequence that we're looking at. And this is generation time. This is just converting the number of generations into the number of days. And then this one half, remember, we have, to, we have to account for the fact that evolution was happening on two different branches, one that went from the common ancestor to here and one that went from the common ancestor to here. And so we have to account for the fact that there's basically been twice as much opportunity for mutations than the actual time that we're trying to date back to. And so we have to account for that, that one half right there. So let me just sort of, that's a lot to take in. Hopefully you understand this equation, but let me just sort of go over it a little bit more in, in detail, try to give you a better intuition for how this equation works. Um, and so what we have here, what this whole section of the equation does is it answers this question, how much time would have to pass to explain 10 mutations? So we have 10 mutations over the top, and then you have the, the number of mutations you expect per generation on the bottom. And so that together gives you that answer. That's basically like looking at this graph and saying, okay, I want to explain how, how long 10 mutations takes. So I go to the y-axis, that's substitutions. So we have 10 there, and then we, we draw this line, we connect to, you know, to this trend of the number of in substitutions over time. That gives us the slope of this line, gives us the rate of uh, substitutions. And so then we connect here, we go down, and that gives us a number for the number of generations. And so this calculation here is really doing that. So I hope this sort of visualization helps you out a little bit. So we have the number of generations it would likely take to produce 10. Then we have to have this conversion factor where we take generations and turn it into you know, days or calendar time. And then you wanna also make sure that you account for the fact that this evolution wasn't happening on one branch, but two different branches. And so you have to correct using that one half. So if you do that, uh, if you follow those instructions, you can plug and chug uh, the equation uh, here, and you get this answer of 11.1 years. Remember that this is all predicated on the idea that there's no selective benefit or disadvantage to any of these mutations, that they're all neutral mutations. And so the best way to, to the best information to use is uh, substitutions that are happening in a pseudogene, a part of the genome that you know is dead. And so it doesn't matter if a mutation happens there, it just, it changes the underlying code, but doesn't change the underlying biology of the organism. And so this is kind of just, I think of it as like kind of a reservoir, getting mutations, they sometimes reach fixation because of drift, most of the time they go extinct, but this is, this is kind of a clock that's just capturing all of these mutations and the number of mutations is going to correspond really well to um, how long that sequence has been evolving. So yeah, I hope that, that that helps you guys out a little bit with understanding this. So, but when we actually looked at real data, we would often calibrate a clock. And we have to do this for a number of reasons. One, sometimes we don't have really good estimates for mutation rates. Sometimes we don't have we don't have very many synonymous mutations or viruses don't tend to have pseudogenes because their genomes are really compact. And so there isn't a good gene to look at for the accumulation of mutations or, or we don't know the mutation rate or there's just problems. And so the way that we get around that is we just look at our data. And so if we have a time series in which we sampled our pathogen, we can look at different pathogens genomes and the number of mutations that occurred in those genomes. And then we can establish a relationship between those two variables to see how strong that relationship is, will determine how good the clock is, and the steepness of that relationship will determine how fast that clock is, so how fast molecular evolution is happening in this pathogen. And so we've seen lots of different clocks, and I just wanted to point out that, you know, if you had a pattern like this, this is a very tight relationship, so that's a very good clock. 
It's highly, your dating using this clock is highly reliable. Whereas this is a much poorer clock, yes, there's an overall positive relationship uh, with time and the number of mutations, but it's not, it's, you know, there's a lot of variance, there's a lot of error associated with it. And so your ability to date based on this clock is not going to be nearly as good. So this is a clock that you've looked at many, many times. And we see that there's basically the substitution rate for SARS-CoV-2. This is from nextstrain.org is about two mutations per month. And this looks like it's a pretty bad clock, but actually this is just, there's tons of data in here. And so actually this is a pretty, pretty nice clock, pretty uh, repeatable. And so we actually do have pretty good resolution to go back in time in this phylogeny and pinpoint things like when did these strains first emerge in China and so forth. So you take this phylogeny, you find ancestral strains that you want to sort of date, maybe when it arose in China or when it spread to North America or when it spread to Europe or so forth. And so you can use these patterns in the phylogeny. The coloration here is for different regions. And so you can go back and say, well, when's the first time we see a strain in North America? And given the phylogeny, this is the first time that we're able to see it, but actually maybe it came earlier on. And so when did the sort of ancestor to the strain actually move from China to here? So what's the window in which it could have spread to, to North America? Uh, and so you can use that phylogeny where you um, establish you know, these evolutionary relationships, and then you can use this clock to figure out, well, this is separated by a single mutation. A single mutation happens in about half a month, about two weeks. And so there's a two week window when we think that the strain moved from China to North America. So, and we've gone over a lot of times how to use these molecular clocks coupled with phylogenies to, to figure out when common ancestors happened and when evolutionary events happened. Okay, now what I wanna do is I wanna present that DNDS ratio, the non-synonymous versus synonymous changes in a, a slightly different way uh, than I talked about it before. I wanna link it up to that molecular clock a little bit tighter. Uh, and I hope that it gives you sort of just a better understanding of how that calculation works and, you know, what's happening when these, or these organisms are evolving and how we can use this DNDS ratio in order to uh, determine if there's positive selection or negative selection. Okay, so say, you know, this is just building off of the, the example that we've been going over from molecular clocks. We have a you know, very regular rate in which you're getting an increase in the number of synonymous changes over time. And so what we could do is we could compare non-synonymous changes. So changes that actually influence the, the protein in a way that natural selection may be able to see those changes. And so the question is, is the rate of increase of non-synonymous changes equivalent to the rate of synonymous changes? If so, then that should be a pattern where these mutations are actually just behaving neutrally and that natural selection is not affecting the evolution of that protein. If you have an acceleration, acceleration is, is positive selection, a deceleration is purifying selection. And so you could look at a genome and you could see that, oh, actually the rate of non-synonymous changes over time is heightened above the synonymous changes. And so you could say, oh, it looks like, you know, it looks like this protein that I'm examining is actually experiencing positive natural selection. But there's one caveat, there's one hitch there. We know that that molecular code that determines whether or not a mutation causes a non-synonymous changes or synonymous change is biased. And it's biased in a way that the first two nucleotides tend to change the amino acid. And the third nucleotide tends to be redundant and not change the amino acid. So the first two sites tend to cause non-synonymous changes, where the third site tends to cause synonymous changes. And so the, the code is biased towards producing more non-synonymous changes than synonymous changes. And so this elevation of the rate of non-synonymous changes might not be caused by natural selection, but just caused by this bias in the genetic code. And so what you need to do is you need to establish what your expected 
rate of non-synonymous change would be under just neutral evolution, but given that there is additional bias of caused by the, the genetic code. And so what I'm saying here is that here is the underlying rate of evolution that's just neutral evolution, no natural selection happening. And here is the underlying rate that is just neutral evolution as well, but for non-synonymous changes. So basically you're, you're taking this vector here, this rate, and you're saying, well, how much more often do I expect to see a non-synonymous change versus a synonymous change? And that sort of that, that elevation, that steepness of the slope, this angle here is determined by just that proportion of non-synonymous changes to synonymous changes. And so that gives you this new expectation. So yes, it has a steeper slope than the synonymous slope, but it's still neutral. It's just factoring in the bias that's caused by this molecular code. And so once you establish that what your expected non-synonymous rate is given neutral evolution, then you can ask, you know, when I look at an actual genome, does it have an elevated rate of non-synonymous above, above this expected, or is, it, or is it below? And that will tell us if it's positive selection, experiencing positive selection or purifying selection. And so what's happening here is, the expected is this graph here, where there's just neutral evolution. Yeah, there's some substitutions through time, not that many. It gives you this sort of slow rate of uh, increase of number of substitutions. Whereas when you add positive selection, you're really hitting that gas pedal and you're elevating the rate of substitution in that protein. The opposite is true for purifying selection where this is, this is what drift looks like. You get some substitutions over time, whereas you put some negative purifying selection on that sequence on that protein, and you begin to really reduce uh, the number of changes that are happening in non-synonymous sites in that protein. So, okay, this is sort of understanding you know, rates of substitution given neutral evolution and synonymous mutations versus non-synonymous mutations and we're factoring in genetic code. So how does all of this really relate back to that, that initial equation? So remember, we have four parts in this the NDS ratio equation. We have the number of non-synonymous substitutions observed and the number of non-synonymous sites. This is possible non-synonymous mutations that would cause a non-synonymous change. And then this is just the number of synonymous mutations observed divided by the number of synonymous sites um, in, the, in the sequence. Um, and so basically this vector here, this line here is this, this part of the equation here, okay? And then you have to use two bits of information to calculate this line here. So that is the relative number of non-synonymous sites to synonymous sites. So this is over this in, the, in, this, in this equation. And so you use that ratio in order to extrapolate from this rate, given the, that ratio of this to that, what is this angle here? And what is this, what is this trajectory? So now we've, exp we've shown sort of, these are the three parts that we've used so far to get to here, and then, we add in the observations of you know, what we actually see, the number of the, the rate of non-synonymous change over time. And then here's where the sort of the equation completes in that we see that this is greater than this. And so actually this is gonna give you a value above one. If, if this line laid right onto this line, then it would give you a value of one. Uh, if it was below, then it'd give you a value uh, below, below one. And so, I hope that sort of this gives you more of an intuition for, for how this equation works. If it doesn't, you know, don't, don't worry about it. I'm just trying to give you sort of additional ways to look at these evolutionary processes and how this equation works. So one thing that you might be questioning right now is, well, in this equation, you know, we're putting in specific numbers of non-synonymous substitutions and specific numbers of synonymous substitutions, we're not inserting rates into the equation. So how does that work with, with my explanation here? 
well, we kind of are looking at rates, right? So we're, we are, we're taking OTUs from modern day. So we have these two different sequences and we're looking at the differences and we're looking at which differences are non-synonymous and which, which differences are synonymous. And it's with this idea that sometime in the past, they were actually the same sequence and they diverged from each other. And now we get these two new sequences. So actually, you know, what the DMBS ratio is, is, you know, looking at the evolution that happened in this time period to give you these two new divergent sequences and assessing, is there a bias towards non-synonymous changes or synonymous changes? And that will tell us something about natural selection, how it worked. So I hope that that might help out a little bit and sort of connect different parts of what we've learned about the evolutionary process. We use the MDS ratios to understand the evolution of a number of different diseases, SARS-CoV-2, to understand what genes were under positive selection during the epidemic of DeLosa and CF patients in Boston. HIV has an interesting pattern where within patients you have you detect positive selection, but between patients you you detect neutral evolution, suggesting bottlenecks between patients drive a lot of its evolution at that stage. And so I just want to sort of circle back to this thinking of random processes and deterministic processes. We have, you know, neutral evolution is the random process. The signal of it is captured by the DS. And if DN deviates from DS, then that's a, that's a pattern created by natural selection. Another non-random pattern that we observed that indicated natural selection was in the phylogeny for seasonal influenza, where we have these uh, we have this directional selection that's driven by our immune systems learning about what influenza strain is infecting us, conferring resistance, favoring the emergence of a brand new strain that, that the immune system is unable to detect. And so you have all of these different antibody types uh, evolving through time of influenza. And the overall pattern is, is this direction because influenza is always running and changing from our immune system and heading off in this, this sort of race against our immune systems. Knowing that, that there's strong selection happening on influenza from one year to the next as people are developing immunity to, to the current strains and knowing some other features about how natural selection acts on influenza, we can actually uh, take that information and predict what strain of influenza is likely to dominate in the next year. And that was this model by uh, Luxa and Lazig that we talked about, where it takes in information on beneficial mutations in the epitope, deleterious mutations in the core of the protein that destabilize the protein and interfere with its function. We can look at its, fre its frequency uh, from one year and then predict what uh, strain is likely to dominate in the next year. So make sure to go over that. I think it's a really nice application of evolutionary biology to, to medicine. We talked about a couple different adaptations uh, in the second half of the term. We talked about host range expansions for viruses, uh, and we also talked a lot about transmissibility and virulence and how they evolve. For gain of function mutations, we talked about the four mutations that have to occur in the HA protein of influenza in order for it to spread in humans. In the experiment that they ran, it spread from one ferret to another ferret through, through the air. Ferrets are a model system for uh, human transmission as well. Uh, for some reason, because of their biology, and the receptors on the cells that influenza uses. They are similar between humans and ferrets, so it's a good model system. We also talked about my research and how we showed that a virus, bacteriophage lambda, is, uh, readily evolves to use a new receptor in the course of just weeks. And the way that that happens is it, it bends the rules of the central dogma of molecular biology and uh, the mutations that accumulate in the, in the gene cause the peptide to actually fold into different uh, conformations of the, the host recognition protein. And these different conformations interact with different molecules on the host outer membrane, uh, allowing them to expand their host range to use that, that new second molecule. We talked a lot about this, about how the nature of the trade-off between the infectious rate or transmissibility beta of a virus and its virulence, that, that steepness of the trade-off curve can lead to either selection for a more virulent, more deadly virus, or a more benign, 
or attenuated uh, virus. Uh, and so it's all about the sort of trade-off. So this is genetic variation of single uh, virus. And this relationship establishes whether or not you get pushed in this direction or you get pushed in that direction. It turns out that HIV has a well-established trade-off between these two variables. And so this is actually new data that you haven't seen before, but it shows the exact same pattern as that data from Uganda that we looked at, where there is this really shallow relationship between transmission rates and viral load of different HIV strains. And so that would actually suggest that HIV should be evolving to be less pathogenic, less, less deadly. And in fact, we do see that HIV C is uh, dominating around the world. It's rising in frequency and it's also less pathogenic. It seems that maybe that's why it's, it's doing so much better than these other strains and spreading further is because it's less harmful. People keep, you know, have uh, the disease for longer and spread it to more people. This is, there was also more direct data uh, in the previous lecture that we talked about this uh, from strains in, in Uganda. So check that out as well. Okay, we are over time and I, this is the last little section here. These predictions for how evolution will happen given these different trade-offs uh, were based on this SIR model. And so remember this model, this is also the model that we're using to predict uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemics. Uh, it's the model that gave us the intuition about flattening the curve. And so remember how the model works. This is what the output of the model looks like, where you have different populations of humans that are susceptible, that become infected. And so this is the rise of the infected individuals, but then they become cured because they develop immunity and then so they're recovered. And then in the end, this virus has sort of burned through this population. Everybody is still alive. They've all just uh, gained immunity to that virus. And so these variables here can tweak the dynamics um, in this plot here. This is the simulator that we we're using to, so that you guys could see for yourselves how these different variables influence these dynamics. The simulator uh, as of this morning was not working. So hopefully that goes back online. And I hope that our class is not a major factor in why it is no longer up. But there's other simulators online and you can sort of just remember the structure to the model and sort of think about how it changes these dynamics. So for instance, if you have higher beta, then you'll get a steeper curve here. And why that makes sense is because basically this, the steepness of the curve, this is S being turned into I. And so if that's flowing at a faster rate, that's going to be steeper and this green is going to shoot up faster. If you change this, so you can think of this as like literally like plumbing, right? Uh, so if this, if this um, uh, tube is wider and the flow is faster through here, then you get infected people recovering very quickly. And so what that would do is it would move this red line closer, closer to the green line. Um, so basically, as soon as the person gets infected, it immediately turns into a person that is recovered. And so you get, you get very little separation between these lines. However, if that is extended, if this is slower, if the recovery time is longer, then you're gonna have more separation between the green and the red line. So that's basically how beta and recovery rate influence these early dynamics of the disease. And then later dynamics that we looked at is if you decrease the beta and you increase the recovery rate, then you can actually get what's called herd immunity, where you have a population that there's some susceptible people in that population and there's some infected people maybe, uh, but they're unable to spread to the susceptible people because there's so many people around them that are already recovered, that act as kind of barriers, and the disease is not very good, has a low beta, or people are really good at recovering from it, and so it's unable to spread. And you can get populations, this herd immunity, where you have susceptible people, but the disease is unable to get to them. And so for SARS-CoV-2, they think herd immunity is probably about 50 to 60% of the population. Okay. So that's the, that's the end of this class. It's been a roller coaster of a term. I'm very sorry about that. I hope that you've enjoyed this class. Um, I, you know, I really want to thank you guys. It's helped me stay focused through this pandemic and now this uh, civil unrest. It's uh, meant a lot that you guys have kept your attention, 
and watched all these lectures and, and learned. So I just want to leave on two notes. Remember to, to consider evolution in your future medical studies, uh, the, the people that are going to go off and be medical researchers or treatments that you are either personally taking or uh, you might be a doctor in the future and, and uh, recommending. Um, and also, if you are a medical researcher, I better never catch you using the word emergence rather than evolution. If it's evolution, call it evolution. Thank you guys very much. Um, this was a great and horrible term. So sorry about that and take care.